Okay, Rhode Island spending and a lot of all the Rhode Island stuff tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Great to have you aboard. Thanks for tuning in on this Wednesday evening. We're a little down production-wise today, so uh, we're not able to bring you the latest from the network and uh, a, a couple of other things pertaining to the president. But I must tell you, as we record this program in the afternoon, which is what our scheduled production time is, uh, just got finished watching the president of the United States with the president of Finland. Uh, who just had very little to say and sat there kind of like, what is this circus? Uh, watching the president suggest that the, uh, the whistleblower, no doubt, and whoever is feeding the whistleblower information are spies. And that, if I heard him correctly, that even Nancy Pelosi looked at the transcript of the call with President Zelensky of Ukraine and felt it to be a perfect call. Uh, let alone the idea that it is now in a capitalized, exploited, deleted fest here for the president on his Twitter account. You know, Kamala Harris was a uh, was one of the first, well, the first presidential candidate to suggest that Twitter should shut the president down, and I beg to differ uh, on a couple of levels. First of all, she needs to show a little bit more First Amendment awareness. That's number one. Number two, uh, the more he tweets, the more evidence we have that the wheels are falling off. Uh, it is beyond my wildest understanding that the uh, Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States, can type the word and something that certainly will come out of, uh, uh, you know, the every man and every woman's mouth from time to time, no doubt, myself included. But to type that in capital letters on your Twitter account and send that to the reported 60 million people that are reading you every day. It, it, it just, I don't even know what the superlative response to that is. But, uh, it's been quite a time. It's in the meantime, uh, here's a headline which uh, buoys our conversation tonight. Ken Block returns to the set, and Ken's always got a lot going on and a lot to say. He is, uh, his latest op-ed on the Providence Schools was an interesting one. Welcome, my friend. Good well, to see you. Nice to be here. Uh, former two-time gubernatorial candidate, watchdog, RIA, and, uh, and a successful businessman and entrepreneur, uh, no doubt about that. Some provocative things to say about about uh, uh, English learners, the high schools, uh, the, the the whole the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, what is it that you were trying to say in this particular op-ed piece? It's all BS. <laughs> Well, stretch that out <laughs> okay. and capitalize it. Yeah. So I, could, I couldn't resist. Um, as we all know, the, the Providence Public Schools in particular, along with a lot of other school districts in the state, uh, struggle. Uh, ah! They undereducate their kids. Uh, I believe that they actually struggle with English language learners in particular, that the, the, many of the districts don't have the right kinds of teachers in place to help kids who come into our schools who don't primarily speak English. And in Providence, we've all heard them now, you know, the, the numbers, 10% proficiency in math, 14% proficiency in English. Uh, and we, the, uh, Providence spends more than $400 million a year uh, educating their kids. And of that four, more than $400 million, more than a quarter of a billion of those dollars are state taxpayer dollars. So we're paying for really lousy results. And what I point out in, in the piece there are a couple of things. So first of all, every year the numbers come out and every year everyone goes, oh my God, they're so bad. But then we never move beyond that point of initial, initially being upset about where things are at to actually getting something done, changing, substantively changing what happens. We have a new education commis commissioner Theoretically, that means that the governor has a different mindset now about the quality, the, the, the results of our educational system and wants to make substantive changes. Uh, 
Our new education commissioner is in the process of taking over the Providence Public Schools. And my first point is a really important one. We all need to support this effort. We need to give her every uh, bit of support that we can because ultimately she has a lot of hurdles to overcome to make the kind of changes that have to get made. I mean, she needs to turn that district upside down. She needs to make personnel changes. She needs to make uh, curriculum changes. She probably needs to totally change how English language learners get taught in those schools. And she's going to have tremendous pushback, right? The, the supporters of the status quo, the, late, the teachers union in particular, uh, aren't going to want to hear about some of the necessary changes that are going to come. And uh, most importantly, we have to give her the support she needs to make those changes. And until she does, and until she gets that support, and until she can make those changes, what happens year after year after year in Providence is we spend all this money, kids are socially promoted through the grades, and uh, they get further and further behind from their peers in other places in terms of what they learn. Okay. It's a terrible scenario. All right. Well, I, 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 I could quarrel with anything that you said. I'm not sure you're saying anything new. Not yet. So, Meaning? So uh, when we get a little bit deeper into the piece, uh, the thing that I think was particularly provocative and purposely provocative uh, is I question whether or not institutional racism plays a role right. in what's happening in the Providence schools. So we all know that the schools underperform, and they've been doing it pretty much since I arrived in Rhode Island in the early 90s. Um, Is the way that the Providence School Committee and Providence mayors make their decisions, is the way that they assess what they believe their student body is capable of, can it be that when teachers don't show up and are chronically absent, might it be because they maybe don't want to teach the kids that they're in front of them, right? There's, there's a, there are a bunch of questions that I ask in this piece. when. The Providence, when the city of Providence decides collectively that they're not going to maintain their school building infrastructure, are they potentially looking at the population and saying they won't mind? Right? When they have entire generations of, of kids who are not being taught effectively, do they look at those kids and say, well, it's okay because they're not up to the task anyway? Right? These are all subtly. These are all subtle examples of something that generically is called institutional racism. This idea that a class of people, and it could be based on race, it could be based on uh, your demographics, it could be based on your income level, right? There's a lot of different ways that institutional racism is a little bit different from crass racism, right, where you use the N-word and stuff like that. That's not what institutional racism is about. Institutional racism is diminished expectations, right? Well, those kids are never going to excel, so if they don't, who cares, right? And why should we bend over backwards to try and teach them because they're so disadvantaged in the first place that they're not going to amount to very much, right? Those are, those, the answers to that question, can any of these decisions be linked back to this concept of institutional racism? And it is documented that the idea of diminished expectations can absolutely be uh, followed backwards, and you can d you can see that in a lot of examples of diminished expectations, there's this basic mindset of those kids can't be successful, and so therefore we don't expect them to be. Well, look, I, it's it's a complicated it's a complicated situation. But you raising the question of 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 of, of the presence of institutional racism is, I think, a constructive one. As a subset of, of your conversation, I asserted here on multiple occasions on both this platform and on the radio that when Jorge Alorza, the mayor of Providence, suggested that there would be a weekend and he did conduct a Friday, Saturday, you know, bring your own work clothes to the community to clean up a handful of schools that he identified that needed extra special attention, that while there are always a little project or two here across whatever school system that might exist in the state, uh, and you can in pockets you can see little examples of hey, the community rallying to fix up a cafeteria or something like that, or build a playground, or build a playground. Which, right. by the way, um, you know, my wife and I had a hand in doing in Cumberland more than a decade ago. So that stuff is real. 
and it happens. But amidst and post the Johns Hopkins report, with the squalor and the and the and the just torrid description of the physical plants, for him to suggest that the citizens or the parents or the students even for the for, you know, who, who are constituents of those schools should come and pitch in, and that it was part of a community effort, was one of the worst racist propaganda moves I have seen in a long time because nowhere else in the system, I'm sorry, nowhere else in the state could you get away with that. So that feeds, you know, I had Deb Gonzalez from the uh, Immigration Law Study, uh, um, uh, and she and I uh, high-fived each other here a week and a half ago over the same thing because she said, oh my God, there's finally someone who agrees with me that that was one of the worst things she had ever seen, yet nobody else would call him out on it. And that's, that's part of the, don't worry, these people, you know, we'll let them help themselves. Right. It's a, it's a low expectation worry. They, they're, not, they're, not, they're not capable of pushing back. So let's just... That's right. They can't advocate for themselves effectively, right. so they're stomped on. All right, so what do we do? With, uh, is there a solution to that? Let, when we come back, you know, I think Ken identifies something that may be very real. Uh, how you fix it is a whole nother ballgame. Stay with us. Yeah, same headline, the same op-ed. So you get a lot of feedback, right, from, from writing this. Yeah, I got it. Uh, it's probably had the most feedback of anything I've written ever. Uh, the it was immediate. Uh, there was a lot of the 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 the, the potential charge of well, label it for so, me. Was it a charge? Was it an innuendo? Was it a suggestion? Was it a question so, about so, institutional racism? Right. So so basically, what I am I'm stating that we need to look into what role institutional racism plays in the dysfunction in Providence. And I've heard from a lot of recognizable names uh, who contacted me and said, thank you for bringing this up, right? No one who's been actively engaged in the conversation and, and public people who have not participated at all at going down this road. Um, and I also heard from a lot of people who were very upset that I would suggest that racism could be a factor in the dysfunction in Providence. Uh, and I pushed back against that quite a bit because um, well, first of all, again, I said racism. I meant institutional racism, right? There, there's a, and I think a lot of people don't understand the difference between the two terms, right? Institutional racism is not the Providence School Committee collectively uttering the N-word, right? That, that's not what it right. is. It, it, it is a much more subtle, maybe not, they may not even understand that their actions could be linked back to this well, sort he, of Here's thing. an example of it. So I'm not going to name names here, but... I had a high-level elected official tell me that in attendance at a, at, a, at a meeting on education matters with some high status quo folks here in the state discussing the Providence and other urban school systems. It was suggested by a very highly respected uh, and I'm guessing well-meaning individual that we really ought to be doing what we can to shift the focus of many of these city students to the trades. <laughs> Diminished expectations. To, to, and by the way, I don't want to ever think, and we're going to have an economic cyclical uh, void here for electricians and plumbers and, I mean, th there is honor in that work. And it's needed for this economy, and we're going to have some problems right now. If you're a contractor, you, you got a lot of work, and you'll probably you'll probably survive any kind of down cycle on the economic basis, basically, basically because you, there aren't enough quality people out there anymore. But the assertion that there ought to be a focus in that direction with the preponderance of these urban students is what you're talking about, no doubt. Is it mean spirited? Not necessarily. Correct. Is it? Is it unwitting Probably. racial bias? No doubt. Yep. And that's what feeds institutional racism. Correct. Right? Yep. 
Absolutely. You know, those, uh, it's those kids. Yeah, they could be plumbers, right? And I know lots of plumbers, and I know <laughs> some of them make a, more a, than I do, it, right? Yeah, I mean, no, no, it's, a, it's so an honorable it, choice. It, it, there's no question but the, about uh, the, it. But the point is, is that these kids are not prepared for academia. They're never going to get there, so why don't we just... Why don't we just re, you know, rearrange the way we're thinking about this thing? So what I think what a lot of people also don't understand, uh, and I'm going to use Providence, since we're talking about Providence as the example, but there's other places that have, the, there's other school districts that have the same problem. All of the scientific uh, studies say that if you're not a competent reader by the end of third grade, you've missed the boat, right? And, and everyone else's educations go up like this, and yours are going to stay here or maybe even drop over time because you can't self-teach. So third grade is it. If you're not a competent reader by third grade, uh, the, the educational system has failed you. Uh, and shocking numbers of Providence kids leave third grade unready un and unable to read. Now, is that a failure of the student? No. Is that a failure of the system to meet the student's needs? A hundred thousand percent yes. And we have to stop that because we are, look, everyone is, is t talking about the increase of violence in Providence, right? There's shootings, there's mayhem, there's, there's stuff happening in, in Providence. How much of that is a byproduct of a whole generation of kids who were handed a diploma but were unable to, to operate at anywhere near a high school level of competency, right? What do they do with themselves when they come out of high school with a diploma and they have the edu don't have the education to match. They can't go on to college. They can't get a skilled job of any kind. Uh, and a lot of them probably haven't even been trained on how to focus, how to right, so concentrate so and everything so else. How do, you, how, do you, how do you move the Titanic on this yeah. one? I, I, I think in a number of first painful you have, ways. It seems to me first you have to admit there's no way that you've got to get consensus that this is happening. Yep. I think that's coming because it, with the there's state... No, there's no sense of even actually thinking right. about a strategy to fix it if everybody doesn't agree it, it exists. Well, I think now the state's taken it over. Uh, you don't have to convince that many people, right? So there, there's, there's really, there's one set of decision makers now that are going to operate this district and they're going to take the actions they deem necessary to fix it. To me, that's incredibly encouraging because we've cut a lot of the static and disagreements out of the process because we've had decades for them to hash things out, right? And by them, I talk about the school committee. I talk about the Providence City Council. I, I talk even about the unions to some extent here because they've all played a role in getting us to where we are right now. And we can't keep doing that. We have to do something different to get ourselves out of it. So I'm not as worried about the consensus piece of it because the takeover eliminates a lot of the need for duking out what the root cause is. We're going to define the root cause and then we're going to make changes, right? We're going to, I'm sure they're going to change things contractually. If it was me, I would absolutely restaff the youngest grades, especially where there's English language learners. If you have classrooms of mostly, for instance, Spanish-speaking kids, if you don't have a Spanish-speaking teacher in there teaching them how to speak English, you're really deserving them and you're setting them up for failure. Right? And I suspect to some extent that's happening. Uh, they, will, they will make the changes, and you have to start at the earliest grades. How do you fix somebody who's a sophomore in high school who has a fifth grade, fifth grade level of reading comprehension and math? That's very hard to fix. Right? And I'm not aware of anybody who successfully knows how to remediate that at this point. So first order of business is stop the pipeline of failure and you stop that at the earliest grades, uh, as you get a, a handle on that, will probably be blazing ground. If they're going to try and figure out how to remediate and offer help to the students have, who have progressed much further through the system, uh, I think that that would be new ground. It's important ground, and, and hopefully we can figure that out. But I'm not aware of anybody who on a school district-wide basis knows how to fix 10% math scores for juniors and seniors in high school. Hmm. It's really hard. But that crowd is, well, you can't say they're out of luck. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what you do to remediate the, the lost learning, but the Ed Commissioner is going to have to figure that out. She's yeah. kind of overdue to come back in here, so we'll ask her about that. In the meantime, the cost of living is rising at a lesser pace than the cost of government. Can you believe that? Next. <laughs> Thank you.
What I meant to say is that the uh, the rate of income growth is less than the rate of spending at the General Assembly. The Rhode Island Public Expenditure Council came up with that uh, report this week. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my, I can't believe that situation exists. Do you think it's possible that this General Assembly would look at those numbers and say, you know what, we got to put some kind of governor, not Raimondo, but governor, some kind of limit, some kind of equation, some kind of a formula on spending, not unlike Proposition 2 and a half in Massachusetts uh, that limits the growth of property taxes in the town to 2.5%, uh, unless you override, not unlike the 4% cap we have in property taxes here. Yeah. Why can't we tie cost of state government to income indexes? Simple. Because our pension system is still really broken. Uh, Rhode Islanders have put billions of dollars more into our pension system over the last six years than we were scheduled to put in pre the pension reform. The stock market doubled and yet today the pension system is funded at exactly the same level it was at the reform. So what's happening is we're dumping more and more and more money to support state retirees and teacher retirees. Uh, and they're go it's gobbling up so much of our money that we use to spend on other things, and uh, that merry-go-round is never going to stop. We're going to have to continue putting more money in to keep the pension system afloat. Uh, I believe it's not fixed, and unless we actually fix it, uh, I think we're always going to look at these escalating costs. There's a huge chunk of money that goes to servicing and keeping our pension system. So you're not afloat. suggesting this is discretionary spending nope. as, as much as it is systemic spending on, on retired uh, We have more retirees drawing pensions at the state level than we have workers feeding into the pension system. It's upside down. Mm -hmm. Let alone what's happening on the municipal side with pensions that are irretrievable and, and health benefit programs that are completely not funded, like in Warwick. Yeah. So, you know, Warwick, 30 seconds. Warwick has close to a billion dollars of unfunded liabilities between uh, health and health, lifetime health care for its retirees. And the mayor and says the city is solvent. And he says the city is, has no financial worries. I'm there. Uh, I watch every day because I, I will yank my business out of there when they try and jack my taxes 20%. That's a promise? That's a promise. All right. Well, let's work on this institutional racism stuff. We'll get, uh, we'll get some takes. It certainly is a conversation that makes everyone uncomfortable, but no one said it had to be comfortable. Ken, thanks. Final thanks, word of the week and back. Stay with us. You know, these are hard conversations, but you know, we've got to be conditioned to have some hard conversations. The data itself ought to inspire a conversation, not just about institutional racism, but about fairness and about our own economic benefit because these kids are here and they're not going anywhere and they need to be taught because they need to be productive members of a society that we all live in. We'll see you tomorrow night and on the radio at 3 on WPRO. Thanks for tuning in.